Welcome to another edition of the Giants Little Podcast brought to you by Citizens, the official bank of the Giants. I'm John Schmoke, joined by Matt Sytak as we react to the final episode of Giants Hard Knocks offseason. The final episode is in the books, Matt, and we saw the Giants uh, complete their draft. And then I guess I'll start here. Didn't get much after the draft. Like, you didn't get much of the spring workouts at all. You got, like, a little montage at the end. So it was pretty much draft. We're done. Yeah, I mean, I guess... They premised the whole show about, you know, this is how Joe Shane and the front office build the roster, and the draft is the last big part of building the roster. So I guess they thought, hey, we don't have to, you know, show anything after that. You know, the undrafted rookie free agents, you know, a couple of signings that happen after, you know, they just decided to cut it off after the draft. Yeah, it's almost, it was almost more like Hard Knocks front office than <laughs> like Hard Knocks off season. You know what I yeah. mean? Because the off season would have included all the OTAs and mini camp and stuff like that, but it was really more just free agency and the draft. So it was almost to me it was kind of like Hard Knocks off front office rather than Hard Knocks off season. Yeah, which was a little surprising because I mean, the cameras were still here throughout the off season program yeah. after the draft. So I thought they were going to show, you know, at least some of the clips from OTAs. I mean, especially some of those Malik Neighbors highlights, like kind of incorporate that into the Malik Neighbors getting drafted part of the show, but they decided not to show any of it. So, yeah. yeah. But you know what? We got a lot of good information, good stuff we to did. talk about here. And it started obviously with basically the draft beginning um, in Vegas and finding out who these teams were picking. And we saw in the previous episode that the Giants, obviously, like all NFL teams, try to figure out what other teams in the draft are going to do. And it seemed like they had everyone pretty locked in. The team they weren't sure about were the Chargers. And we saw when they went on the clock, and now this could also be edited to provide some drama in terms of creating good television. But there did seem to be some, well, you know what? We think they're picking an offensive tackle here. They didn't know if it was Joe Alt or J.C. Latham. They also thought a wide receiver was, you know, not impossible in that point. Uh, I, I enjoyed the little back and forth between Joe Shane and Brian Dable in the draft room where, where Joe Shane is, I could tell, he's nervous, but he's trying to stay relaxed. And he's asking, so what do you think here, Latham or Alt? And he goes, I think they're picking Latham. And then he asked Dable, well, who do you think they're going to pick? And he just goes, not Malik, <laughs> <laughs> which I thought was funny. Yeah, watching that scene, I mean, it, it kind of made me laugh a little bit because that's kind of how, like, I felt when I was waiting, watching the draft, waiting for our pick, you know, in our own little draft room we have of our digital department that we say in all the draft weekend, you know, we were sitting there being like, who the Chargers are going to take? Who the Chargers are going to take? Really hope it's not Malik Neighbors. Like, hope it's not Roma Dunze. Hoping for one of the receivers. And so it was kind of funny watching the decision makers sit in the actual draft room, sort of sitting there waiting, thinking the same thing. Like, please no, please no. And I... The one quote I wrote down for that scene also, what you have, just not Malik. That's pretty good. <laughs> that was a great quote by Daves, but that kind of just goes to show how much Daves loved Malik Neighbors and really wanted him here. I mean, from the, I believe the first or second episode, from the first time they showed Malik Neighbors, I believe at the Combine, Yep. it was very clear that Brian Dable fell in love with the kid and wanted him here basically no matter what. Yeah, and then after the pick, Joe Shane kind of pokes Daves. You know, Daves, who's such an emotional guy during games, and he talks about he's a temper and all that sort of stuff, very stoic in the draft room. Like, doesn't <laughs> say much, kind of just sits there. We'll talk about a bit of a little reaction he had a little bit later on in the show. But eventually, Shane is like, trying to, I feel like he's trying to get Daves excited. Like, come on, man. Like, aren't you excited? He goes, yeah. And he goes, come on, man. According to you, he's the best wide receiver in the draft. So you heard Mike Gross say that in last week's show. Yep. That he thought Neighbors was his top receiver. And now we find out, at least according to that kind of back and forth, that Dable had him as his number one guy as well. Yeah. I mean, that's, it seemed to be, I mean, you mentioned Mike Groh said that Malik Neighbors would be his top choice. We saw that clip last week. That seemed to be... I don't want to say the consensus because we don't know what every single person in the front office thought, but it was very clear that Malik Neighbors was at or near the top of the Giants draft board. And once they made that pick, they were ecstatic. They got their number one playmaker, their number one receiver. And, you know, we always talk about wants or needs me meeting with best player available. And that's exactly what happened with the Giants, with Malik Neighbors. They needed some an offensive playmaker, someone that they could just get the ball in his hands and let him go. 
And Malik Neighbors is probably the best player in the draft in that regard. Yeah, we saw, I think Joe Shane was talking, I think it was to Ryan Cowden, basically saying, look, we have, you know, Neighbors and Adunze are ready here. Those are the two names you want to have ready here just in case you pick. Again, you know other people could have been in the mix there too that they didn't want to put them in the episode. But uh, they had one more chance to trade out of the pick. The Colts made a call. Uh, offering 1546, their second rounder this year, then their second rounder in 2025. Joe Shane talking to Chris Bauer is like, all right, I'll let you know. And he's then he hangs up the phone. He's like, yeah, I don't want to go that far down at the, to 15, which is understandable because at that point, you're not getting a Dunes and you're not getting Bowers, which are the two names we talked about uh, after, I guess that was what, episode four? Yeah, four? last week. So, um, they just didn't want to move that far down. And and for two twos, it, it's a nice value. I, I get it. But if you're trying to target one of those playmakers, you can't move down nine spots there. Yeah. I mean, it, it definitely is good value. Two second round picks. Giants could have had two, you know, very solid players. They would have had back to back picks in the second round with 46 and 47. But yeah, again, they needed a playmaker. And like, yes, they, if they dropped a 15, Joe could have, you know, worked some magic to try to move back up, but that would have then cost, at least some of the additional draft capital that he had just gotten from this hypothetical trade. If they stayed at 15, like, yeah, they could have taken what, when, when did Brian Thomas go to the Jaguars? Was Actually that... brought up the draft just so I could answer these questions. Brian Thomas, I think he didn't go to the Jaguars until like 21, I think, or something and like that. He right was the first receiver gone after a That's correct? correct. Yes. Yeah. So like they could have taken, yeah, 23. 23. Mm -hmm. So they could have taken Brian Thomas Jr. But as we've spoken about, in, especially in the lead up to the draft, there was a pretty significant drop off between the top three receivers and then the next guy. So I don't blame Joe at all for rejecting that trade. I would have done the same thing. You know, we talked last week about how, or at least I would have been somewhat interested in that Me hypothetical too. Bears offer, but that's because it would have basically guaranteed that we still would have gotten Roma Dunze or Brock Bowers. Dropping to 15. You know, maybe if the Giants hadn't done the trade for Brian Burns and Ed Rusher was still a need, then dropping to 15 and picking Lautu, who the the Colts ended up taking, then I could have seen that being, you know, a potential possibility. If they maybe did a trade, and you know, instead of trading for Brian Burns, traded for a wide receiver, maybe then I would have considered it. But given where they were and how free agency went, they had to stay at six and take Malik Neighbors. And then in the tease last week, we thought we might get a trade offer from the Jets, but that never seemed to materialize. We didn't actually hear what they offered. I was a little disappointed about that. I wanted to hear what how much they were offering. Or Especially since they had two ones. Yeah. I mean, I can't imagine it was much. If I mean, it, as, we've, <laughs> as we've seen, Joe made it very clear that if Malik or Marvin Harrison were on the board at six, they were taking him. But whatever the offer Joe Douglas made, it couldn't have been that much if Joe didn't even bother like repeating the offer or saying it to the room. I mean, I'm sure he said it to someone in the room, but it was very clear that he just shot it down immediately. So there's no way that it would have been much value there. You're ready for a change. Payday comes early with citizens. So go to that retreat. New you moves to the country. Now you're raising goats and launching a lifestyle brand. Are you ready for all that life brings? I'm trying to think where I'm looking for the other Jets pick here. Where I'm, what am I missing? Did I, didn't the Jets have two ones this year? Am I remembering that incorrectly? No, I think I that they was, did. Oh, so oh, that, maybe, maybe that was two years ago. I'm thinking about. Think, yeah, yeah. But um, so the Jets did have a lot to offer there, but. Again, we never found out what the uh, what the offer was. So uh, heading into round two, I thought it was interesting. Joe kind of updating his his little board on his wall before he you know left for the night on Thursday. Then coming back on Friday, he kind of sits everyone down again, throws out some scenarios as to what might happen. And this is tough, right? Because the Giants in round number two, because they had traded their early round two pick in the trade for Brian Burns, right? So the pick they had left, I believe they were picking 15th in round number two, right? Yep. So there were 14 players that had to go off the board before you're selecting. So you can't really lock in on one or two guys. That's not how this is going to work. So you have to have multiple backup plans based on how the board might fall. So it was pretty clear, and this should be no surprise. We talked about this on Big Blue Kickoff on Friday afternoon. We talked about it all throughout the draft process. We knew cornerback was a huge need. And yeah. the, the team needed wanted to try to add someone at cornerback. And they liked two guys in round number two, Kool-Aid McKinstry and Kamari Lasseter. Yeah, and the Giants got close to getting one of those guys. Five picks away. They were within five picks, and then there was a little run on the corners, and both those guys got taken. 
and you know looking at the reaction in the draft room i mean they showed ryan ryan cowden coden cowden cowden uh we heard him too we, we yeah we heard <laughs> his reaction when he found out that Lasseter was going i believe it was 42nd overall he was not happy and then when he relayed the message to the room you know brian dable kind of looked up at the ceiling visibly frustrated uh so it was clear that those two guys were pretty high up on their on their board at that point but as then we saw you know a, a few moments later where they did a flashback to earlier in the day Joe had a contingency plan in case those guys were both gone. And it seemed like he didn't think they were going to... The nice sense listening to Joe talk about it, I thought it was... Shane felt it was more likely than not those two guys would have been gone yes. by the time the Giants picked. Yeah, I think it was a little bit of like wishful thinking. Like, let's hope one of these guys drops to us. Yeah, it probably scenarios. won't happen. And he had a backup plan, and a backup plan that clearly Joe Shane, Shane Bowen, pretty much the whole defensive staff felt great about and that was taking Tyler Newbin at 47 he was Shane Bowen said he was his number one safety he was a lot of people's number one safety I mean they showed a a, a sound clip of Daniel Jeremiah from NFL Network talking about Newbin saying he was his number one safety in the class as well last week we spoke about how Nick Saban said that Newbin was his number one safety so the Giants got the best safety in the draft in a lot of people's eyes uh, they mentioned several characteristics of Tyler Newbin. Uh, blue, ball hawk, leadership, communication. Checks all the boxes. And should come in and start right and contribute and, right yes, away. Yes, come in and contribute mm -hmm. year one. I mean, I think they actually said start year one for, for Newbin, if I'm not oh, mistaken. Okay. I think they did. Um, so, yeah, I mean, especially after Xavier McKinney left in free agency, safety was a, somewhat of a big hole for the Giants roster. I mean... Yes, they have some young players and guys that have actually been playing really well to start a camp between Jason Pinnock and Dane Belton, but they added a young guy here who, as we just said, checks all of their boxes, can come in and start playing right away, and they seem pretty happy with it. Yeah, and the other thing they mentioned, the analytics department was big on Newbin. They said ball production in college does tend to translate to the yep. NFL when you look at um, some of the studies that they've done. And I think they're just big fans of him as, as a person and a player. Uh, they did talk about the potential of potentially trading up to make sure you got one of those cornerbacks in round two. Joe Shane said it would cost him a fourth-round pick. And given the fact they only had six players, and I think they realized they were still trying to fill out this roster, there were other needs. Uh, that was the pick they eventually used on Theo Johnson, that they didn't want to lose a pick where you can get a contributing player given where this team is in terms of roster building. Yeah, I mean... Obviously, at that time, you don't know who's going to be there in the fourth round. So you don't know what that pick's going to turn into. But looking back at it now, knowing that the Giants got Theo Johnson in the fourth round, I'm very happy that they stood Pat took Newbin at 47 instead of trading up. Because at the end of the day, I would rather have Tyler Newbin and Theo Johnson than one of Kool-Aid McKinstry or Kamari, Kamari Lassiter. For me, that's like... There's no doubt about it, especially given Darren Waller's retirement. I mean, Theo Johnson could end up being this giant starting tight end. We don't know that for sure. There's going to be a lot of competition, and he may not start right away. He may not even start as a rookie. But I don't think it's going to be too long or too far down the road before Theo Johnson is the giant starting tight end. It could be next year, but that I do think that will eventually happen. I mean, and we, we'll talk about this a little later when we talk about the scene of Gi the lead up to Giants taking Theo, but he clearly was a, a great prospect and someone that the Giants thought very highly of. So I, w I was grateful that they did not do that trade. Football season is coming and so is the next college semester. If you need funding, a citizen student loan could help you pay for 100% of your school certified costs. Get your rate quote in about two minutes at citizensbank.com slash pay for college. All right, they did get the cornerback, Matt. In round yep. three, a guy that they termed a three-down nickel cornerback. This might have been my favorite part of the whole episode, just the talking about Drew Phillips. There were so many different things here that I thought was very interesting. First of all, Jerome Henderson and Shane Bowen, who Joe Shane asked their opinions of Drew Phillips prior to calling in the pick, 
both said that they see him as a three down nickel cornerback. Uh, Joe and Joe also mentioned that they see him potentially starting or playing inside and outside. Yep. Which we know how much the coaching staff loves having versatility, at basically any position on this roster. Uh, but the quote that really stood out was, I believe it was Joe that said that Drew Phillips was the last corner we'd be fired up about before getting to the developmental guys. So again, another guy that they clearly thought this kid can come in and play right away. I mean, they Joe mentioned that if they were to get Drew Phillips, they'd be getting a starting cornerback. He called him a starting corner multiple times in that scene or in that little segment of the show. So they clearly thought very high of him. And I like that they went back and showed the clip of Drew Phillips when he came for a visit earlier in the offseason with Joe and Brian Dable. And I believe it was Dave's asked him, what is your number one trait on the field? And he said that it's his toughness. And he said, I'm not scared of anyone once I step on the field. I love hearing that from any guy on the field, any position, but especially a starting potential starting corner who's going to have to face some, you know, very talented wide receivers. I love a guy that has the mentality of I'm not afraid of anyone. I know what I can do and I'm willing to go up against anyone. Yeah, and I think more importantly, if a guy you're going to have to play inside that has to do a lot of run support stuff against pulling guards and, you know, tight ends, you need a guy that's willing to stick their nose in there and be tough to stop the run, especially when you're playing inside. Yeah, and I mean, we're only a week into training camp, but we've already seen Drew Phillips make multiple plays in the run game. That's correct. Running up and shutting down running backs, you know, at or behind the line of scrimmage. So, again, it's it's only been a week of camp, but so far the things that you know they discussed about phillips his characteristics we've already seen on the field yeah he's he's a he's not just a cover corner he's a football player he'll oh, stick yeah. his nose in there and, and he's got the the right attitude absolutely 100 percent uh third round now or rather third day and we kind of heard from tim mcdonald and we heard from brandon brown throughout the episode as well as along with joe shane talked about how day three is tough because you're looking for needs that you want to fill but you also want to pick the best player so you kind of have to balance those things as you move forward here. I'm always the best player available guy on day three because I feel like it's so tough to try to fill a need. There's just not that many guys left on the board that you think can eventually become a starter. So if there's a guy out there that you think can become a good player, just pick him and then you figure it out afterwards. Uh, but the Giants did manage, I think, to do both. And we'll start with Theo Johnson. And they talked about his explosive measurables. Uh, Brian Dable really liked his actual physical measurables in addition to that talking about him as a guy that's you know 6'6 260 uh that can move and the i think i don't know if it was shay tierney or someone that had him at one of the um uh someone that had him at one of the all-star games had yeah, a little it was, scattered it was, it was tyranny, 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 right Bowl. and it was basically said he's respectful but he's tough and he never wants to miss a rep so it seemed to be a good combination of traits that they liked yeah i mean that was the one guy where it's where at least that we saw on in hard knocks where Joe said like there was just total conviction from the scouts and the coaching staff. Everyone seemed to be on the same page about Theo Johnson. Uh, the A good thing that the Giants were able to do was, and Joe mentioned this, was they got so much exposure to him throughout the offseason. Uh, I don't know if, you know, they anyone went to a Penn State game to scout him during last season. They didn't mention that, but... I'm sure somebody was in one at some point. Uh, yeah, Come for on. sure. But then... The Senior Bowl, we sh we saw the one brief clip of Shea Tierney talking to Theo Johnson on the field, as you just mentioned. Then uh, Dennis Hickey, along with a couple of scouts, were at the Penn State Pro Day. Um, I don't know if they met him at the Combine. But they clearly, prior to the draft, had multiple occasions where someone from the organization, someone from the front office or coaching staff, was talking to him, kind of getting their hands on him, they seeing... Dave, wasn't there a scene where Dable was sitting down with him at a table in front of a large TV monitor going through a play? Yes. That, that might have been, you know, at the at Combine, the... they do like the little 10 minutes at a time interviews with these guys. My yeah. guess is that that was what they call the car wash, and they bring the guys kind of in and out. That's mm. where it looked like maybe Dable was Yeah, they didn't. That, I think you might be right, because they didn't actually they say didn't, no. what where that scene was. I was actually trying to figure it out watching it. Me too. It. I'm like, I thought maybe <laughs> they met with him at the Senior Bowl, potentially, but I couldn't, you know what? I couldn't figure it out. That also could have been the Senior Bowl. You you got a little bit of time with these guys at the Senior Bowl, too, so it actually, yeah, you're right. That, that also could have been the Senior Bowl, no question. Yeah, but trying just, to figure out where Dable wore that black hat. Did he wear the black hat at the Senior Bowl or at the Combine? I'm trying to remember. I think yeah, I think you had a lot of the combine. We have to look back at the <laughs> photos on Giants.com. Uh, we are. 
you love turf. You're good at it. So you start a turf biz. Business grows, your savings grow. Become the most celebrated name in turf. Are you ready for all that life brings? But yeah, but they just, it was clear that so many people in the front office and the coaching staff loved him, loved everything about him. Uh, you know, coach called him a dog, which I feel like there have been a couple of guys in this draft class that have gotten that, you know, characteristic. I think we're up to three dogs now. <laughs> uh, and the other thing that just stood out to me, I, I don't know if it was Joe or Dave's, but they just mentioned he that he's so explosive for a guy his size. Yeah. I mean, he's 6'6", 240, 245. I think bigger than that. Even. I, 250, I around that size. Yeah, I'll check it. And he's fast. So these are, I mean, at that point, we didn't know whether or not Darren Waller was going to retire. It seemed like maybe they had an idea of where he was leaning, given the fact that they went and, you know, targeted Theo Johnson in the fourth round. Uh, but, yeah, it was It's not that I expect. 6'6", 259. 259, wow. Yeah. That's even bigger than I thought. Yeah, large, large guy. And, yeah. and again, I mean, every, when you have a guy that that size that tested the way he did, and they kind of went through his his measurements: four five seven forty yard dash, a one five five split, which is great. Then he also jumped just under forty inches, a ten and a half foot broad jump, a seven one five three cone, a four one nine short shuttle. And look, tight end has proven to be a traits position. Mm -hmm. They don't all hit. We've had plenty of guys with traits get drafted over the last couple of years, and they haven't hit. But the guys that do, more often than not, test extremely well. Yeah, I mean, we on BBK, we've talked about his uh, his Raz score yes. being one of the highest a tight end has gotten in the last, like, 40 years. And to have a, a, a guy that athletic with his size, that doesn't come around too often. Yeah, and Tyrone Chasey, he tested similarly well. Yep. They didn't talk much about his athletic test, and they did talk about how the analytics department had some good numbers on him in terms of explosive plays per touch. Um, and look, we saw that, and they said they basically took the fact that he'd only been a running back for one year, was an older prospect, it turned that into a positive that, well, maybe there's some more upside here where he can continue to get better since he doesn't have a lot of experience at the position. Yeah, Joe kind of mentioned how some teams thought that was like a negative for Tyrone Tracy, but they viewed it as a positive you know less carries under his belt could potentially have a little more longevity in the nfl at that point uh it was good to hear joe talk about how the analytics department was so high on him and clearly showing that joe relies on those guys and trusts them with you know their their opinions and their research that they do on these prospects uh yeah and the one the other thing that i wrote down here was joe mentioning his explosive play per touch ranking towards the top of all the running backs in the draft. So when to, when you get to the fifth round, and you can get a guy like that, You it's 100% worth, I don't even want to call it a risk because it's a fifth round pick. You know, if a fifth round pick doesn't hit, you know, no one's going to blame you. It's not like the end of the world. But Tyrone Tracy seems like a guy that clearly the front office thinks very highly of and thinks that he could be a part of this offense you know, both now and moving forward into the future. No, nope, absolutely. And I think they're excited about him. And then finally, they drafted Darius Musel out of UCLA. Yeah, which they, unfortunately for Darius, they kind of just breezed over that part of the draft. They had a nice video of him with the little lay on and all yeah, that. Yeah, sort of and then around. when they showed, uh, was it Joe and Marie Brian and Beth wives, yeah. mm -hmm. talking about watching his like little selfie video, which shout out to the Giants social team for organizing and getting those videos on on draft weekend uh but yeah there wasn't much shown about darius musau and the what went on to make you know lead the giants to that selection but we've spoken about him before and i think he's a guy that at least this season could be a big contributor on special teams yeah, we had we had some cameos from our social team during the episode as well. Oh yeah, <laughs> a lot of cameos. We the, had other cameos too. The hard, the, the hard hitting question of ha! was it Bachelor or Love Is Blind? Yes, which uh, <laughs> and it was pretty clear. I think it was Andrew Phillips. Is that who she was talking? Yeah, to, Emma was talking to, and um, got the feeling that he had no idea what either show yes. was, which makes me <laughs> like Andrew Phillips even more. <laughs> I gotta be honest with you, I, I really do. Um, and then they kind of did a little montage at the end, and the one thing a couple fans have pointed this out, like 
like somebody as an athlete as much as Brian Dable likes Malik Neighbors. <laughs> because, my gosh, he is a fan. And if you're drafting in fantasy this year, folks, you want a guy that's going to get a lot of targets, go draft Malik Neighbors. Yeah. He, he, I, it's pretty clear Brian Dable is going to make sure that guy has the ball in his hands an awful lot. Yeah, I wrote down this quote I forgot to mention earlier from Dabes, word for word. We knew that was going to be the player that we were going to take if he was there. That's conviction right there. You love to see it. And just sticking on Neighbors for a second, we forgot to mention the, the little segment of the show where Joe talked about the benefit of having an elite wide receiver on a rookie contract. Mm-hmm. I mean, as we've seen this offseason, the last couple off seasons, the top wide receivers in the leagues in the league are signing crazy contracts. You know, thirty, thirty-five million dollars a year, and staying with their team, so they're not becoming available on the yes, free agent market. You rarely see one of these top elite wide receivers become available, and it, even it if about, they do, it would likely be in a trade, and that's going to cost you some serious draft capital. You took the words right out of my mouth. It's just like the Brian Burns deal, right? Wide receivers are very much like edge rushers. The elite guys are not going to hit the free agency market. You're going to have to use draft capital along with money to go and get those guys. Yeah, so now the Giants have Malik Neighbors who they clearly think can become an elite wide receiver. He's not there yet, obviously. He's never played a down in the NFL yet, but they clearly think that he has the ability to become one of the top wide receivers in the league and they're now going to have him on a rookie contract for four years plus the fifth year option. I mean, in an ideal world, Malik plays so well that they end up signing him to a big extension way before the end of that contract but nonetheless they have him under team control now for five years at a very reasonable rate for what they think he's going to contribute on the field yeah should be a lot of fun final thoughts before we say goodbye here as we do our Uh, final hard knocks review love the show overall I'm happy that they did it I mean as a football nerd and someone that loves the offseason part of the NFL it was very cool just to see behind the scenes of a front office and like really in depth and i seriously hope they continue this version of hard knocks you think they'll find another team to do it Uh, well i think similar to the preseason one they'll force another team to do it you oh you you think they're gonna try to make this mandatory i don't see why not i mean they already have preseason that's mandatory and the in-season that's mandatory why not make the off-season one mandatory especially because Moving forward, it's not going to be us again, at least not for a long time. Yeah, what though? If, if, you, if you're doing three of these a year, teams going to come up more frequently than you think. That's true. I mean, I feel like the especially in- since four teams are in the in season one. I was going to say if they can, especially if they can continue the in season one being a whole division, then yeah, the Giants will make an appearance on Hard Knocks again, not too far down the road. But at the same time, if you're covering four teams, that's less airtime per team, so less sh- being shown in each of those buildings. So this afternoon, I'm going to have a chance to talk to uh, two of the producers behind the scenes of this, of Hard Knocks. So um, I'll pepper them with a bunch of questions of how they went about this. I'm, I'm even, here's what, here's what I'm going to do. Just j- just for the crazies out there, I'm going to throw all the crazy conspiracy theories theories at them and I'm going to let them shoot them all down. What, what are some of these crazy conspiracy theories? Oh, staging scenes. <laughs> deceptively editing stuff to show something happened even though it really didn't. So basically lying through deceptive editing. So I'm going to throw all these conspiracy theories at them and let them just laugh and shoot them down, <laughs> which will be fun. Well, I'm that... also going to ask how the how the in-season with the whole division is going to work. I'm actually just curious about yeah, that. Yeah, same here. So we'll find out. We'll have that episode. I'll probably either – maybe we'll move that to Friday, Pearson, to get it all out of the way this week, and, and we'll move Sando to, to uh, Monday of next week. But we'll figure that out. It's coming your way. Thanks for being with us on the Giants Huddle Podcast, brought to you by Citizens, the official bank of the New York football Giants. Matt Sytac. This has been fun doing these episodes with you, my friend. Yeah. I am John Schmelk, and uh, we probably won't be able to talk about Hard Knocks and the Giants for a very long time, but I hope you enjoyed these episodes. Stay tuned to the Giants Huddle Podcast for continuing coverage of everything New York Giants throughout training camp.